forward. Got... So. Oh, oh, go ahead. Are we good to go? We're good. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first uh, breakfast networking uh, event of the year. My name is Kyle Burgess. I'm the chair uh, with the New Market Chamber of Commerce and also an employment lawyer with Mink and Employment Lawyers. Thank you for coming to uh, this month's breakfast networking event. Like I said, it's the first one of the year. Um, if I could just remind everyone just quickly, if, if you can, just uh, mute your, your, your mics there for a moment because we're going to have a, a few uh, uh, presentations here this morning. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the following uh, board members and dignitaries that are in attendance this morning uh, from our board. And of course, the speaker this morning, uh, Pierre Bonhomme from Chagares and Bonhomme Chartered Professional Accounts. Good morning, Pierre. Uh, from Tree Frog, uh, James Daigle. Good morning, James. Uh, from the town of Newmarket, we have Councillor Bob Quapis. Good morning, Bob. And uh, from MPP Christine Elliott's uh, constituency office, Don Gallagher Murphy. Good morning, uh, Don. Good morning. And like I said, uh, thank you to Pierre uh, Benham. Uh, and of course, uh, he's the treasurer of our board of the chamber for agreeing to share his tax season tips this morning. We'll be hearing from him very shortly. Um, we have some good news to share. Uh, we, we have nine new members that have joined the New Market Chamber of Commerce in the past few months. Uh, please see the complete list of all the new members in the contact sheet that will be emailed to you following this morning's event. I would like to recognize our new members who are in attendance today. Uh, so first of all, I would normally ask you to stand, but I think that would be silly on, on Zoom to do that. So just wave at the camera or something like that. Um, so first we have Bob uh, Minus from, uh, uh, oh, I don't have the name of the company. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, good morning, Bob. Um, good morning, the name of the company is Bob Minhaus. So there you go, that works oh, out well. There you go, it's a, <laughs> it's a two for one. Good morning, Bob. Uh, uh, from Smart Cell Communications, Roshan Rego, good morning. And from Workforce Planning Board of York Region, Al Wilson. Good morning. All right, everyone. Uh, let's give a, a silent muted mic uh, applause for all the new members that have joined us. We also have a few uh, important upcoming events to mention. Please visit our chamber calendar on newmarketchamber.ca for more details. Um, this Thursday at 9 a.m., so the, the, most, the, the one that's right up next on the agenda, is the New Market Chamber will be hosting a virtual federal pre-budget town hall with MP Tony Van Bynen. This is your opportunity to share your vision and ideas for how we can simulate, uh, sorry, stimulate job creation, strengthen and grow the middle class, and build a better economy for everyone. We're excited to announce a new initiative as well that we are launching a virtual experience designed to bring organizations and customers or consumers together. Shopping from home is, is at an all time high. Uh, what better time to launch newmarkethomeshow.ca. Again, that's newmarkethomeshow.ca. A, a dynamic virtual showcase that brings the home show to you. With packages suited to a variety of budgets, there's plenty of opportunity to participate. Book your space before Tuesday, February 16th. Again, that's Tuesday, February 16th. So about a week away, a week today, for a special 20% early bird rate. For, for more information, please reach out to Roseanne or Tyler at newmarketchamber.ca. I would now like to have uh, Abdus and Adam jump in to provide a, a chamber update. Uh, Abdus uh, and Adam, I think I saw you both there on the screen. Yes, you're both there. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Kyle. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I will do a quick update on the recovery activation program. I have spoken to many of you about it in the past. It is a program that uh, was uh, offered uh, in partnership with both the province and uh, FedDev. Uh, it's an expansion of the digital Main Street program. It is uh, built entirely around getting your business online. Um, well, more than just having a website, operationalizing everything that you have on the back end, uh, linking it together, and really customizing your operations for the uh, for both the COVID and post COVID reality, where uh, everything is uh, online. Um, this is the page. Uh, when you go on the page, the only thing that you are asked to do is complete what what's called a DNA, uh, a digital needs assessment, and this will help the program administrators uh, identify where you are in, uh, in your digital journey, so to speak. Um, once that's done, you will be uh, onboarded onto a full program. Um, the, the name is a bit misleading. It is essentially a, uh, an, uh, an incubator, an accelerator on the digital front. 
Um, it's a fantastic program. If an average business was to go through this, uh, they, it would cost them about $50,000. Um, but uh, recognizing severity of what, uh, what COVID uh, has done to the business community, um, this is being offered completely free. Um, it's, uh, it's in place until March 2021. Um, that's when the funding will expire. I encourage everyone to take advantage of the program uh, as it is, um, regardless of whether you are on the e-commerce front now or you're looking at a transition to e-commerce front. This is it. This is the reality we're in. And uh, it's, it's definitely here to say consumer behavior doesn't change overnight. So that's my plug. Uh, Adam, did you, I'm just going to turn it over to you uh, for, uh, for the more pertinent update on the policy front. Oh, no problem. Thanks very much. Um, so I think the first thing I'll jump to uh, quickly was uh, yesterday's uh, announcements that came out from the province in regards to reopening. Um, so with any look, at, with any luck, sorry, it looks as though some of the lockdown measures um, are going to be rolled back over the coming weeks, potentially. Uh, and one of the big changes is that um, once these are eventually rolled back, that uh, non-essential retail will be open to a 25% capacity, which was obviously different to how it was prior to the lockdown, where it was only the big box stores that were able to stay open. Uh, the only thing we need to be a bit cautious of is at present, York Region is scheduled to um, come out of its uh, stay at home order and go back into the gray zone uh, on February 22nd, but that's entirely dependent on uh, the numbers trending the way that they continue to. So that may yet change, but with any luck, that is some good news on the horizon. Uh, so beyond that as well, there's just a couple of uh, government programs that are out that um, Addison, I found enough, were on a call with a couple of ministers last week, and they uh, sort of gave a presentation on this. Um, so there's the Ontario Small Business Support Grant and the um, Energy and Tax Rebate programs that they've rolled out. Uh, so the former is essentially a grant that will give you between um, $10,000 to $20,000. Um, there's a bunch of criteria that you have to sort of uh, fill out, but in theory, it's open to all businesses from all sector provided they're on lockdown. Um, and then the energy and tax rebate program is essentially just what it sounds like. You essentially send your bills to the government and uh, they'll give you essentially a, a rebate uh, on any of those costs. Um, the former program, I think, has been very, very well picked up and we certainly encourage you to apply for it if you haven't already. But the um, energy rebate program, for some reason, uh, hasn't been uh, picked up the way the government would like. So we sort of continue to advocate for that one as well, because I think that's a very another excellent option, um, you know, given that everyone has those costs. Uh, on the federal level, it's been a little bit quiet, but there was one major announcement that came out last week, which I'll just go over, which is the um, HASCAP loan, which is the highly affected uh, sector credit availability uh, program uh, has been announced. Um, so that's a loan. Originally, when it was announced, it was, uh, as it sounds like, specific, for specific sectors, but it's actually for, you know, just any business that appears to have suffered a decline of 50% in revenue. Again, there's criteria that you'll have to fill out to, to sort of work out how eligible you are. Um, but it offers a loan of between uh, 25,000 of up to uh, $10 million. Um, and it's uh, up to, and you can get the loan for up to 10 years in length. Um, oh, sorry, apologies, up to 1 million, not 10 million. I've plopped in an additional zero there for some reason. Um, and about, so it's up to um, 10 years in length, the loan goes for. Um, it's open until uh, June 30th for applications. Uh, like most of the other government stuff, you have to go through your financial institution to apply for it. Uh, and I think just on, on, on behalf of the New Market Chamber, this was something we were, uh, we were advocating for on behalf of the tourism and hospitality sector, given uh, how hard they've been hit by that. So uh, with any luck, like, this, uh, this is a program that will sort of, you know, tie up a couple of the loose ends in terms of businesses that are still suffering and potentially will suffer so, sort of for an extended period of time. Uh, that was everything I had. So I don't know if you pass it back to you there, Abdus. Thanks, Adam. Um, Don, I noticed you're online. Is there anything that we missed that, you, that you'd that you want to add? Sure, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I would add to that uh, just a few quick items. Uh, the Ontario 2021 budget consultations, uh, those uh, have started at the beginning of February. This past Friday, we had a virtual consultation for York Region, uh, which was done uh, along with uh, the Durham Region as well. Um, what I would like to ask if you have uh, uh, any 
comments or suggestions for the province on how to address the 2021 uh, budget for the best measures related to our economic recovery, you can still submit the online survey or you can email uh, written submissions. So the online survey is ontario.ca forward slash budget consultation. I will put that in the uh, chat and the emailing of written submissions goes to submissions at ontario.ca. So I'd encourage you to um, use that to submit uh, your ideas on the recovery of our province. Uh, another point um, I wanted to add, uh, Adam, you did a great review there on the support for small businesses. As of this past Thursday, I can confirm that there are now over 70,000 small businesses that have applied for that loan. So um, I encourage you, if you have not yet already, please do um, uh, go online and uh, apply for um, that grant. Um, other than that, um, you may have heard that um, there's some additional funding uh, that has come out for our school boards that was just announced just over a week ago. It seems like the past four weeks just seem like one week to me anymore. Um, but um, the other week uh, they did announce 381 million more investment in our schools of which 90 million has come into York region alone. Um, other funding announcements that have taken place. If anybody here is involved with a horticultural uh, society, there's been 5 million uh, slated for horticultural and agricultural societies to help them with the recovery. Um, as well, uh, you may have heard uh, some of the gas funding announcements for the municipality. Um, I will take note that in 2020, just here in town of Newmarket, town of Aurora, and the municipality of York, uh, between the uh, Safe Restart, COVID-19 Resilience Stream, and the Social Services Relief Funding, um, over 90 million dollars came into just our area to uh, help with a variety, keeping the municipalities uh, from running deficits, et cetera. So there's been uh, funding coming in to our area to help. Um, I know from a business perspective, uh, really Adam covered it um, uh, the vast majority, and we encourage you to apply and submit uh, your bills for the um, um, relief related to property taxes and gas relief as well. Uh, that's about it for now. I'm hoping and praying like you all come February 22nd, we will be released into at least the gray zone and quickly thereafter move into the red zone. So uh, thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. And uh, just to recap, um, uh, all the information that's been provided on the grants and loans, it's uh, accessible on our website. I've included a link there. If you have any further questions uh, for uh, on, on any of the specific loans or grants or, or how to or get more information on any of those pieces, please just shoot us an email um, and uh, we'll do our best to answer your question. If not, then we have uh, we've been at this for a year. We can connect you to the right person right away. At this point, uh, Kyle, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Abdus and Adam and Don. Thank you very much for sharing some additional information as well. Um, all right. Without further ado, let's uh, hand over the virtual microphone to Pierre uh, to take us through uh, his tax season tips for us. Pierre, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and welcome. I know everybody... Uh, love tax just as much as I do. And uh, I had to put some thought together uh, to how I was going to present this in a, in a logical manner. Um, so basically, what we're going to talk about is changes to reporting that were caused by COVID-19. Um, and the most logical way to tackle that is we're going to basically go almost program by program and basically summarize 
uh, quickly what the program was about and then how that affects either the reporting you have to do or the income you're going to have to include and how that money is going to be taxed. Uh, so the first program that had rolled out was the 10% temporary wage subsidy for employers. And if you recall, that was just the reduction of source deductions up to 1,375 per eligible employee. Then came the CBA loan. Then we had the CICRA, which was the le less popular um, rent subsidy that was handled by landlords, uh, which some landlords chose not to give to some tenants or choose to uh, extend it. Uh, then they came out with the SERS to replace the CICRA. Um, where now it's not controlled by the landlords. If you have a drop in revenue and you're paying rent, you can apply for this rent subsidy and it's the hands of the tenants now. Uh, we have the, uh, the SUES, which is the, uh, the wage subsidy. Then we're gonna go through some of the Ontario grants, some of which have already been mentioned. Uh, the changes to the T4 slip reporting that has to be done uh, for this particular year uh, brought on by CRA to track uh, some amounts and they brought in four different boxes and we'll go over that. We'll go over all of the other grants and subsidies and those ones I'm not going to go in detail just because there's, you'll see when we get to that one, there's just so many available out there and, and whether it's federal, uh, provincial or municipal levels or regional levels, there's just a lot of different money out there and you got to be aware of, of, of the taxation on that. We'll go over some of the nuances uh, that, have, uh, that have changed in the personal tax realm uh, that may be affecting either employees or employers uh, of staff who have been working remotely. And then if we've got time, we'll open it up for some questions if there are any. Uh, so let's move right along. Uh, so first of all, the TWSE, which was, you know, the subsidy was 10% uh, of the remuneration you paid from March 18th to June 19th. It was a set period. That was that first subsidy that came out and it was available to employees for 1,375 for each eligible employee to a maximum of $25,000. Uh, for each eligible employer. So if you had multiple businesses and different business numbers, you could apply for the program more than once. <clears throat> and one of the things that is confusing people is it state, the way that they state it is 1,375 for each eligible employee. However, all you have to do is you take your total number of employees times the 1,375 and that gave you your threshold. It didn't cap out at 1,375 1, per employee. It was for the total, the aggregate. So some, some of our clients had needed clarification on that um, just so that you're aware. So the changes that that brought on, uh, obviously that was a reduction in your taxes. You have to fill out uh, a form PD-27, uh, which is basically uh, reporting to the government how much you claimed, what periods you claimed them for, and they're going to use that to reconcile your, your PD7A, your source deduction remittances for the year against that subsidy. Because what's going to happen now is when you file your T4s for the year, you're going to compare how much you should have, have installed in, in source deductions versus how much you paid, and there's going to be a difference which needs to reconcile to the amount that was uh, provided under this program. And so you have this form that you basically now have to fill out. Uh, you can do it either online, and this is what it looks like. It's a, as with every other government form, it's a little convoluted, but you have to basically say which periods were covered, how much uh, was taken, and then the full um, uh, source deductions, the wage subsidy claimed, and then the percentage that was claimed, and then the total, and then you've got to submit that to CRA. So you can either do that using that paper filing, or if you have access to your CRA account online, you can also do it through uh, the CRA business portal uh, for every individual employer. Um, any questions on that one? No? Maybe we'll just do questions as we go. But um, next one is the, the CBA loan. So that was, uh, right, so things have changed. It was originally the 40,000, it's now $60,000. So they increased it by 20,000 as of December 4th. Um, if you receive the 40,000, you can apply for the $20,000 expansion of which now 20,000 of the 60 is forgivable. Okay, um, and just one caveat on that is to apply for the extra 20, uh, I'm a strickler for details, so you know, read the fine print. It basically says that in order to qualify, even though you got the first 40, you must still be 
uh, severely impacted by COVID and have reductions. So if you were a business that originally was shut down and you applied for the first 40, if you're back fully operational and you're not being impacted, um, you know, it's a, it's a questionable whether you should be applying for that other $20,000. All right. And then you have until March 31st, 2021. So you got a month and, and a half left to, or maybe just a little bit more than a month and a half to, to, to apply for uh, the loan. Now, here's what most people are missing. The loan forgiveness, so that 10 or the $20,000 must be included in income in the, in the year you receive the funds. So what that means is if your taxation year was before December 31st, so let's say you had a July 30th year end and you had taken the first 40 in June, on your July 30th or July 31st year end, you should have had $10,000 of taxable income inclusion on that forgiveness. If you happen to miss it because CRA hadn't been very clear on, on those uh, pronouncements at that point, like with a lot of other of their programs, um, you have to, you're going to have to file election under subsection 12, 2.2, and it's not a prescribed form to basically include it in the subsequent year. All right. So you're not, you know, you're, you don't have to go back and amend it unless you want to, um, but you have an option. So any money that you're getting, you know, that, that forgiveness is taxable when received. So if you're a December 31st and you've already received that first $60,000, you need to include $20,000 of taxable income of debt forgiveness that needs to be included right away. And yes, I know a lot of people said, well, it's not sure whether or not I'm gonna be able to repay it before the deadline and take advantage of that $20,000 forgiveness. However, CRA's rules are you, you tax it when you get it. And then in two years from now, if you don't repay it, then you can include it as an expense and then take the deduction at that point. We then go to the CICRA. Uh, so that was the, the rent subsidy program where the landlord forgave 25%, uh, the tenant paid 25%, and effectively the provincial government paid 25 and the federal government paid 25% of the rent. Uh, so what happens to that is obviously rent, rental income is rental income is taxable. So any rent received, whether it came from the government or your tenant is 100% taxable, just like it would be any other rental income in any other year. Uh, and there's one thing to note is the subsidy portion of the rent that was given by the government was HST exempt. So obviously you didn't collect HST on that because the government didn't pay it up. Uh, then we move on to the SERS, which is the new uh, program, right? So any businesses that are being severely impacted, right? So from September 27th until June, 2021 can claim for a subsidy. And that's, it mirrors the, the wage subsidy where the amount of subsidy and rent reduction that you're gonna get is equal and it's, it's part of the calculation as a percentage of your revenue drop. So it's gonna be different for everybody. Uh, the provide, you're right, it'll provide directly to qualifying renters and property owners without requiring participation of the landlord. So that helped because a lot of uh, negative feedback was provided uh, by businesses that were that had landlords who just didn't want to give that 25% and be out 25% of their rent. Um, although I thought that was short-sighted because uh, I'd rather get 75% of a dollar than zero of, of my tenant going out of business, but every, every landlord is different in their views. Um, and then if you are eligible for the base subsidy, uh, you're also probably eligible for the lockdown support if your business location is significantly affected by public health, uh, which is that other provincial program uh, that was mentioned, the, the small business grant. Uh, so just uh, to be aware here again, so any subsidy that you've applied for is taxable when you received it, but because this is a subsidy and not a grant, if you have a, a December 31st year end and you apply for the subsidy for December in January or February, you need to accrue that, that income and have it included in income in, um, in your year end. So you, it's, this is not a tax when receive, it's you have to accrue for it like anything else because the expenses to which that subsidy relate to have to match. So basically if it's a December expense, rent expense, then the December subsidy that goes along with it, even though you received it maybe a month or a month and a half later, still needs to be included in income at that at, at in, in the year end that it uh, that it applied to. 
All right. Uh, same thing. So when we take a look at the, the Canada Emergency Wave Subsidy, so that's the one where, again, you have this nice convoluted worksheet that you have to fill out, and then you've got to calculate your revenue drop, and then there's a top-up revenue drop based on, on the, the historical and the three-month period. Uh, you also had a choice between doing a month-to-month year-over-year -year comparison or using January, February as your base months to compare to. Uh, so similar to the SERS that we just talked about, you must accrue any amounts applied for in the period to which they pertain. So again, because those expenses had to do with December, even though you received the money maybe in January, you still have to include that as income in December uh, and pay tax on it. Okay, then we'll go through some of the Ontario grants. Uh, so the Ontario Small Business Support Grant, uh, which uh, Abdus and Adam spoke about uh, earlier. So that's to basically help small businesses that uh, due to the shutdown, the, the full provincial shutdown as of December 26th, uh, were affected. And that's a grant that you can get to tend to either up to $20,000. Uh, and now that one is taxed in the period in which you received it because there's no guarantee that you're gonna receive it. And it's basically money that's provided. It doesn't relate to an expense which to, with which you have to match. So even though uh, it's from December to, to January, if you received it in February, you include it as income in February and you'll pay tax on it on your, on your next year end. When we look at the Ontario's Main Street Relief Grant for the PPE support, that's up to $1,000 to help you with any added costs that you received under uh, for, for purchasing of PPE to, to apply to your staff or to, to keep your business open. So plexiglass, masks, gloves, anything else that you could that that you needed. Um, basically uh, foggers if you're doing the, the fogging for, for disinfecting, anything like that. So um, that again, taxed when received. And then we have the Ontario property tax and energy cost rebate. And Adam and Abda spoke about that one as well, where there's not as much uptake. Uh, again, that is taxable income when received um, because you just don't know. Even though this one does have to do with uh, expenses of a previous period, uh, this one is still taxed when received because it is a grant, as, it's a rebate, not um, a subsidy. Okay. Uh, then we take a look at what's going on with the T4s. So because of uh, uh, a bunch of, you know, the, the, the CRB, the CRB, the CESB, the, C, uh, the CB, the, the CBSC now, and all the other C Canada emergency funds for, for individuals, uh, CRA needs a way to find out whether or not you actually worked in that period or not. So what they've done is they've added four new boxes uh, that correlate to the period of the CERB that people were applying for to make sure that they're not double dipping. Uh, so basically on your T4s now, and most of the, the uh, accounting or bookkeeping softwares out there uh, have updated a software to automatically populate these boxes for you when you print out your T4s. If you don't have that or you're not using a supply, you're going to have to manually do it. Uh, but you need to report in code 57, 58, 59, and 60 employment income. So the, the portion of box 14 uh, from March 15th to May 9th, May 10th to July 4th, the 5th to the 29th, and then August 30th to, to September 26th. And that's so CRA can, can have an idea of whether people were being truthful when they were applying for these subsidies personally, um, because they needed to know if people were making over $1,000 per month. Uh, or not, because that was one of the threats in being able to uh, to get that money. Um, and then we take a look at, at the, all the other grants and subsidies that, that are currently available. And this is more of an information uh, if you weren't aware of them. Um, so there's the LEAF, which is the Large Employer Emergency Financing Facility. Then we've got the RRRF, which is the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund. Uh, and this is uh, by the Futures, uh, Community Futures Organizations, uh, the Canada Research Continuing Emergency Fund, uh, HASCAP, which again, Adam and um, Abdus had spoke about earlier, it's ran by BDC, uh, and that one's a brand new one that just came online, uh, I think maybe a week ago. Uh, then there's the, the BDC loans for mid-market and small businesses. Those are two different programs. Again, these ones aren't... Um, aren't subsidies, it's basically loans, which you're going to have to pay back at some point at, at a uh, prescribed interest rate. So they're maybe less popular 
um, you know, than, than some of the, the subsidy programs out there. However, if you're looking at, you know, having to do uh, business expansions, uh, capital asset purchases, they may be something because the, the interest rates and the terms on those loans are, are more favorable than you would get um, in non-COVID times. Uh, there's the work sharing program, and that's uh, by uh, Employment Insurance Canada, so Service Canada. Uh, tourism and hospitality support. Uh, there's seafood grant. There's a black lead enterprises program, and then any other subsidy or grant that's out there. So one thing that you've got to look at for these is you you in every one of these there could be some portion of which is either forgivable or or a grant portion which is taxable. Um, so what everybody has to do is, whether you're working with an account or you're doing your taxes yourself, is review the details of the program um, and figure out whether or not there is a portion that has to be included in income. And then obviously find out whether uh, what the timing of that income inclusion is, because it can be different for every different program as, as we discussed in the other programs. And unfortunately, uh, I'm an accountant, so uh, you know the government gives, the government takes away, so there is no free money. Um, I think it would have been a lot easier had the government implemented a net program where it was just like, well, we know you're gonna have to pay tax on that, so we'll just provide you the net. Maybe, uh, but as, as I've, you know, many of my clients have, you know, gave me that feedback and I just said, well, they don't know one, if you're going to be taxable uh, and if you have losses, so maybe you don't have to pay tax on that money at all. And then on the personal side, they're like, well, they could have just deducted tax off of it. So I don't have to pay it back. And again, there, they don't know what tax rate you're in or tax bracket. So it's kind of like, you know, the, a flat rate when you withdraw RSPs. Uh, and then at the end of the year, you have to pay a bunch more tax because they only withheld 10%, but you're in a 40% tax bracket. So uh, you get a nice little surprise at the end of the year if, if, if you didn't do uh, the proper tax planning. Uh, so then we'll take a look at, at uh, some personal tax changes. Uh, so just so everybody, right, uh, and CRA has already said it, and uh, a lot of people are actually starting to receive the, the T4As uh, that they're sending out for the subsidy programs, which is the CERB, um, which is the, the Canada Emergency Recovery Benefit, the CESB, which was the student benefit, and now the CRB, which is the recovery benefit, the CRCB, which is the caregiver benefit, and the CRSB, um, which that one is the, oh, too many acronyms. I can't remember that one off the top of my head. <laughs> Any amounts uh, received will be taxed in the year which they're received. So obviously CRA, right? If you received money before December 31st, you're getting a T4A for any monies that you received in 2020, which will be taxed and reported on your 2020 tax return. Uh, the next change that is going to affect, I'm going to say, a very large portion of the population is claiming home office expenses. Um, and they've made two changes to this program. So you have the traditional, right? So if you were already working from home beforehand and every year you claimed home office expense, you had your employer fill out T, your T2200, uh, which is a declaration of employment conditions where they're basically saying you have to incur expenses personally, you're still doing that. Really nothing has changed. However, for people that have had to work from home because of office shutdowns or they just couldn't go, so they brought in this new temporary flat method. And that's basically you get $2 a day of, of a deduction up to a maximum of $400 if you work from home more than 50% of the time and for more than four consecutive weeks, um, then you, you're able to claim this. And so you're claiming home office expenses your employer did not reimburse you for. So if your employer paid you back for that or they gave you an allowance or, or something, you can't claim it um, if they're reporting it. Um, but if not, then you get, so that's the simplified method. Uh, and just so that people are clear, um, right? So you can claim it for part-time work or full-time work. However, your home office is only for the days that you actually work. So weekends don't count if you didn't work. Uh, days off don't count or holidays don't count either. It's only for days that you actually worked. Now, the consecutive weeks or more, uh, again, CRA is kind of blurry on that. So let's say you work five days one week and one day the, the, the next week and then three days the next week. Uh, you know, in, in our opinion, that's still consecutive weeks being worked. It doesn't basically define that you had to work full time those weeks. Um, so, and my, my guess is that most people that are beginning to be claiming this will have the 200 days because we're almost 365 days of, of, of COVID uh, lockdown where people have been working either remotely uh, or 
you know, uh, a combination kind of like our office where people are coming in and out based on, on, on schedules where they can't get all of their work done from home. So, uh, they're, they're one day in the office, two days out of the office, one day back in. So that still works. Right. Uh, the other option uh, as well is now they have what's the simplified version. So you have this uh, T2200. So again, you still have to, the same uh, eligibility criteria still apply. So you still have had to have worked more than 50% of the time from, from your house uh, and for four consecutive weeks or more. Um, but your employer, and this is kind of like that T2200 where your employer has to fill it out to declare it. But we have this T2200 simplified version, and I've, I've got these links in here, and I'll show you uh, the difference of how those look. Um, so the T2200S for employers, it's a much more streamlined and simple version, and it's basically one page. And all it is is, did the employee work from home? Yes. Did you or will you reimburse the employee for any home office expense? No. What was the, what was the amount included on the T4 slip, which is kind of, was the amount included on the T4 slip? Yes or no. So if it was a yes, you know, to this box, then you'd actually have to put a yes or a no here. And if it's no there, then it's automatically no here. Uh, and that's it. And that basically allows the employee to then claim uh, on the simplified version, this T77S um, home office expenses that they wouldn't otherwise claim. Now, if you take a look at what a regular T2200 is, now for employers, right, if you had to fill this one out, much more complicated and convoluted because you've got to declare every little thing that they do. Did this employee's contract require them to carry out duties of employment, right? So for the COVID one, um, they're basically allowing employers to just basically say, yeah, we were shut down. This guy had to work from home or, or she had to work from home, right? And we didn't reimburse them. So they get to claim home office expense, okay? Uh, and that's it. Oop. Any questions, comments, concerns? I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, I think I see some in the chat here. Thank you for the input. Can you please share your? Yeah, I'll. I'll I'm going to send the uh, the PowerPoint presentation to. Uh, um, I guess Tyler. Yeah, there you go. I see it. You're you're lucky because I only got the strip at the top, so I see five people. Uh, Tyler and you were one of them. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll, I'll share that and I can send it off. Uh, John, my office space is a new market. My landlord didn't apply for the original. I did not renew my lease that ended September, 2021. 75% is better than zero. Yeah, you got that right. Uh, pros and cons on the flat rate or T2200. So the pros and cons are if you're using the flat rate, you don't have to basically go back and track all of your expenses. So if you're using the, the, the 77S or the, the regular one, you have to have, you know, if you ever get audited by CRA, you got to basically declare, you know, how much in hydro you use, heat, water, gas, uh, property taxes, uh, maintenance and all of those, and you have to have all the re all those receipts and have kept them all, and be able to prove to CRA if if you get audited how much you actually claimed, and then you have to calculate also the percentage of your house that's being used um, right between personal and business. So let's say you have a 2,000 square foot house, uh, right, and you have a 200 square foot office in your house. Well, it's pretty simple: 10% of the total of all those expenses is claimed as a deduction. Um, so some people, right, may wanna crunch the numbers and go, well, which one is better for me? Do I get a better deduction on the $2 flat rate versus doing the, the 77S um, and the, the T2200S that you're, you're, right? And then as well, um, your employer has to do some extra work because they gotta fill out a form. Uh, so it really is just a personal choice on whether or not you tracked all those amounts. Uh, Hi, Pierre, can uh, self-employed people use that? Well, self-employed people, no, because you're already claiming your home office expense on your statement of uh, employment activities. Well, not really, because before you had to have to be visiting clients regularly. So I'm not sure if that would still apply. No. Uh, so if you're self-employed, you can always claim it's, it's employed people that have to basically in order to do it. And that's where that 50% rule is. You have to be meeting clients more than 50% of the time from home. If you're self-employed and, and you only have a home office, then you've always been able to claim your, your office expenses. But I also have an office that's shut down. So you had a, uh, an office somewhere else? 
yeah. So if, if you're doing that, then yeah, then you're going to be able to claim your home office expense if you weren't doing it before. Right. So, yeah. So if you had two locations and you were paying rent, uh, like you were renting office space somewhere else and you're self-employed and you weren't working from your house, it's the same thing. Uh, however, I wouldn't even, uh, you know, again, you're going to claim that on your statement of business activity, not on a 77S because, or a 777, because that's strictly restricted for employees. Okay. Um, oh, did the, uh, the, the, the forms that I pull up didn't show when I pulled them up? Can somebody confirm that? What you have to do is when you would, when you clicked on them, yeah. you shared that stop sharing the original screen. And oh, start the, sharing the, that's why I assume they just showed up on the same screen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the, the, the links are in the, um, in, in the, uh, in the PowerPoint, so I'd be able to see them. Do, do, do you guys want me to show them? I can put, uh, I can easily copy the links if people want to see them. So, um, I think to probably to enable time for networking, Pierre, if they're in the presentation that we're sending off, I think that will be okay. And then, are there any long term implications uh, for claiming home uh, a home office expense? Um, I mean, the only long term. Uh, I guess thing is, it's just one other thing that CRA can either review or, or audit. Um, however, I think for this past year, uh, the threat of that is going to be extremely low because the amount of people that are going to be claiming home office expenses um, is going to be at a record high. So for them to audit that program for everyone that's now claiming it is going to be uh, exhaustive. Now, as most people know, CRA does, um, you know, sends out letters all the time on how much they want to, uh, on, on, you know, basically saying, hey, and they may just test the waters uh, and send out a percentage to see how many people were fraudulently claiming it or, or, you know, inflating their numbers just to keep people honest. So again, I, I think that would be the only risk for claiming that because it's really only on your 2020 tax uh, return. And then maybe again in 2021, depending on, on how long the impact of uh, COVID has in 2021 and have forced people to work remotely. And then they'll probably have a similar program in 2021, I imagine. Uh, anything else? Is there an end date for CRB yet? Uh, they haven't announced that, so no. And the government is continuously uh, updating that. Uh, question relates to change. I think that's uh, that's it. All right. Thank you, everybody, right. for listening. Hopefully, that was uh, that was helpful. Thanks, Pierre. It was, and uh, I don't know if anyone else's head is spinning, but mine certainly is. Um, Kyle, did you have anything to add before we went into networking? No, no. Other than Pierre, great job. Thank you very much, uh, and and a lot of good information there. Other than that, uh, it, it's been a, a pleasure so far. Look forward to networking. Right. I'm Thank sorry you. for rushing through it, but I had a limited amount of time to give you guys a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> no, we yeah. appreciate that. There is a lot going on this year. Um, just quickly, I saw Al Wilson is on the line. I did want to point out that Work in York has some great tools, and that's a workforce planning board program. Work in York has a toolkit for job seekers, employers, employment um, service providers, has some great reporting and some great information on working in York. So uh, check that out on our website or on the Workforce Planning Board site. Um, I'm really impressed with, with what they have going on there. And I am going to turn it over to Tyler um, so that we can do networking. <laughs>